Thanks so much. So it's great to be back here at the ECS. Um, what I'm going to do uh, this afternoon is, um, is basically uh, share with you my latest thinking, uh, not so much on energy and climate, because we can talk about that uh, in the question period, but really what is the biggest sort of driving technology workforce education trend in the world today that is the platform that is really going to drive so much uh, of our energy usage and so much of how we relate to the climate. So I'm going to go down a little level today, right to the core engine room, and look at what I think are the biggest trends in the world today. So when historians look back at the first part of the 21st century and ask what was the most important thing to happen in the early 21st century, what will they say? 9-11? the global recession, the breakup of Brad Pitt and Jen, mm -hmm. or the marriage of William and Kate. What will they say was the most important thing to happen? I would argue that what they will say, looking back, is that the most important thing to happen was the merger of globalization and the IT revolution that that is the flywheel, the biggest thing happening in the world today, driving more energy issues, more workplace changes, more education changes. That is the big thing affecting more things in more places in more ways. Now, this is a subject near and dear to my heart because in 2004, I wrote a book about this, the first book, I, first attempt I made to understand this merger of globalization and the IT revolution, I wrote a book called The World is Flat. And that book basically argued that in the early 20th century, late, 19th, late 20th century and early 21st century, three things converged that created this flat world. The first was the PC, the personal computer, which allowed individuals, individuals, for the first time in the history of the world, to create their own content in digital form, in bits and bytes, whether it was words, photo, data, spreadsheets, video, music. Individuals, for the first time in the history of the world, could create their own content in digital form. That then quickly converged with the invention of something called the internet, which allowed individuals for the first time to transmit their content anywhere in the world virtually for free. And that coincided with something called workflow software. All those protocols you know about, HTTP, HTML, XML, SOAP, AJAX, that allowed individuals to collaborate on each other's content anywhere in the world virtually for free. So what the world is flat really argued was that those three things came together along with search, the emergence of Google, to create a platform where more people in more places could suddenly create content and collaborate with each other on their content for less money with greater ease than ever before. That's what I meant when I said the world is flat. Now, had I been a more honest man, I actually would have called that book The World is Flattening, because that platform really just applied to about a billion people. Well, two years ago, I sat down to write a new book called That Used to Be Us, about America and the big challenges we're facing now. And the first thing I did when I sat down to write this new book, was get the first edition of The World is Flat off my bookshelf from 2004, when I started writing it. Just to remind myself what I had written. I opened it up to the index. I looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, F, A. Facebook wasn't in it. So when I was running around just seven years ago, telling people the world is flat. We're all connected. 
Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was still in the sky. 4G was a parking place. LinkedIn was a prison. Applications are what you sent to college. Big Data was a rap star. And Skype was a typo. Okay. I love doing that. Can I do that again? Okay. All of that happened after I wrote The World is Flat. So what does that tell you? Oh, that tells you something really big happened these last seven years. The world went from connected to hyper-connected and from interconnected to interdependent. It is a difference of degree that is a difference of kind. It is affecting and changing every one of your businesses, every one of your governments, every one of your institutions. You are dealing with the implications of a hyper-connected, interdependent world every day, but no one's really explained it to you. So that's what I want to talk about in the next few minutes, and then we'll have time for some questions. So what actually happened over these last seven years? Well, let's go back to those things that made the world flat. The ability to author my own content, that went from the PC to this. This and the tablet. And this and the tablet connected to the cloud, which meant anyone anywhere had access to the world's most powerful technology tools off the cloud for pennies, dimes, and nickels. Second thing that happened was the ability to send my content anywhere went from the internet to high-speed broadband and wireless. Suddenly I could send my content from more places to more places faster than ever. My ability to collaborate on my content, wow, that exploded. That went from workflow software to Facebook, Skype, Twitter, Kickstarter, Crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, global collaboration exploded. And search, search went from Google to big data. Suddenly I could quickly analyze all the data streams, see that my store at 52nd in Lexington and Manhattan sold more blue shoes than white shoes between 10 a.m. and 12 noon, and suddenly stock more blue shoes. So the world, something really big happened, friends, in the last seven years, and it's affecting energy and it's affecting climate. The world went from connected to hyper-connected. Now, I could talk to you all day about what are the signs of this. I'll give you a few. I, I like to collect these examples. I was, uh, I was in India in uh, October 2010. And I like to read the Indian newspapers. They're fun. They're full of small little stories, very indicative. The Hindustan Times on October 30, 2010, ran this story. It said that a Nepali telecommunications firm had just started providing 3G third generation mobile network service at the summit of Mount Everest. The story said this would allow thousands of climbers and trekkers who thronged the region every year access to high-speed internet and video calls from the top of Mount Everest using their mobile phones. Do you realize how many phone calls are now being made from the top of Mount Everest that begin, Mom, you'll never guess where I'm calling you from, okay? <laughs> That's a hyper-connected world. Here's the hyper-connected world. I was in San Francisco two months ago at an education summit, and I had rented a Hertz car. And in the middle of the summit, my plans completely changed. I had to change where I was dropping the car, when I was dropping the car, all kinds of things. No problem. I called 1-800-Hertz. I got that automated voice on the other end of the phone. 
It said, tell me your reservation number and your problem. I said to the automated voice, my reservation number and my problem. And then I was waiting for the voice to say back, now please stay on the line. A Hertz representative will be with you shortly. Your call may be recorded for quality purposes. <laughs> I never got the person. I did the entire complex interaction with an artificially intelligent human being. I made a mental note of that. I made a note to tell my girls, you don't want to be a hurt service representative when you grow up. <laughs> no problem, I was in Yemen uh, also a couple months ago doing a documentary on climate change in the Arab Spring, and we can talk about that afterwards flew from Yemen to Heathrow Airport. I was in line at Heathrow, and uh, the man in front of me turned around, he recognized me, said, I read your book, uh, you know, um, we had a nice conversation, so I do what I do everywhere. I started to interview him, I said, what do you do? He said, I'm uh, in technology. I said, I like technology, what do you do? He says, I'm in the software business. I like software, what kind of software? He said, we're working on a software to make every lawyer in the world obsolete. <laughs> okay? I thought, <laughs> oh, yeah, baby, okay. What is that? Okay, uh, his name was, um, I've got his name, John Lord, um, uh, and the company's called Neotologic, and if you go to their website, uh, Neotologic is dedicated um, to uh, getting access to advice and justice, legal advice, to the 40 plus percent of Americans who can't afford an attorney and need one. It's basically TurboTax for the legal profession. By the way, their website, uh, you can send in questions, and their website quoted one commentator complaining that this new software can't read, between, can't read between the lines or hold the hands of a client and wipe away their tears. To which Neotologic responded, you will surely see a press release when we can. Okay. So um, I did mention to my girls, they might not want to be a lawyer when they grow up, okay. No problem, uh, my girls are smart girls. Maybe they could go to Grinnell College. Grinnell College, Grinnell College is a very small liberal arts college, 1,600 students in central Iowa. Happens my wife's from Iowa, my mother-in-law, I confess, used to be the chairman of the board of Grinnell College, central Iowa. Maybe the girls should go to Grinnell. But then I found this out that in 2011, 9% of all applications to Grinnell College came from China, and of those, 40% had perfect scores on their math SATs. Hmm. Maybe the girls shouldn't go to Grinnell. Um, I have an idea. Maybe they could get a job. Maybe they could get a job at Jamba Juice. Do you have Jamba Juice in Switzerland? Very popular juice chain in America. I thought that might be a good place for the girls to work, but then I read this article in the New York Times. It said that at the Jamba Juice shop at 53rd and Lexington in Manhattan, along with the juice oranges and whirring blenders, is another tool they use, the Weather Channel. The shop's managers frequently look at the channel's website and plug in the temperature and rain forecast into their software. Um, that is used to schedule employees. If the temperature is going to hit 95 the next day, the software will suggest scheduling more employees based on the historic increase in store traffic in hot weather. At the 53rd Street store, the manager said this can mean seven employees on the busy 11 to two shift rather than the typical four to five. So if the lunchtime rush at a particular shop slows down at 1.45, the software will suggest cutting 15 minutes from the shift of an employee normally scheduled from nine to two. John Bajeev's chief financial officer said the scheduling software had saved the company four to five percentage points and millions of dollars last year. Those are all signs, friends, of the hyper-connected world. Now, what are these telling us? Well, first thing it's telling us, it's gonna be great, as you all know, to be a consumer in this world. Wonderful. You can go to Amazon and get any book cheaply. I get my golf clubs now online, my golf balls online. Get anything online now. 
Okay? You can now buy a Tesla in America online. In fact, that's the only way you can buy a Tesla electric car is online. Be great to be a consumer. It's going to be great to be an innovator or entrepreneur because you're going to have access to all this technology. Going to be great for that. Going to be a terrible to be a leader, to be the leader of anything, a company, let alone a country. Because in the hyper-connected world, every leader now is in a two-way conversation. There are no more one-way conversations. It's going to be a real headache to be a leader. But last of all, the biggest impact, I think, of the hyper-connected world, for my country and yours, wherever you come from, for my company and yours, the most important socioeconomic fact of the hyper-connected world is that average is officially over. Average is now over. We have a saying in Texas, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is all you ever got. That saying is N-A no longer applicable. In a hyper-connected world where every boss today has more cheaper, faster, efficient access to above-average automation, above-average software, above-average cheap labor, and above-average cheap genius, average is officially over. If all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is not all you ever got, you will get below average. Everyone today, you, me, your kids, those interpreters, has to find their extra. By the way, how long do you think they're gonna be around? Okay, um, in a world of Google translations. Hi, ladies. <laughs> um, everyone has got to find their extra, their unique value contribution that will justify why they should be hired, why they should have that job, and why they should be promoted. It's why I tell my girls, girls, I'm an old fuddy-duddy. I'm an old man. When I was your age, I got to get out of college and find a job. You will have to invent a job. That's the biggest difference between us and our kids. We got to find jobs, they will have to invent them. Oh, they may get lucky and find their first job. But to keep that job, advance in that job, be promoted in that job, they will have to reinvent, re-engineer, and redesign that job, always justifying and proving their extra, their unique value contribution. I know what you're thinking. I've given this talk before. You're thinking very easy for you to say, Mr. Smarty Pants, New York Times columnist. No, let me tell you about my job. I became the New York Times foreign affairs columnist in January 1995. I inherited the office in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times of a very famous New York Times columnist and editor from the 60s and 70s, James Reston. What an honor for me to inherit his office. Now, I suspect that back in the 60s and 70s, Mr. Reston used to come to that office and say to himself every morning, I wonder what my seven competitors are going to write today. And he personally knew all seven. I, I do the same thing. I come to that same office every morning and I say to myself, I wonder what my 70 million competitors are going to write today. I have 70 million competitors, bloggers, tweeters, online magazines, and I'm keenly aware of it. You know why I'm keenly aware of it? Because the New York Times last year started NewYorkTimes.com.cn, New York Times in Chinese. They translate the New York Times online version, not all of it, most of it into Chinese, including my column. What an honor. My column goes into Chinese and can be read potentially by 1.2 billion Chinese or 1.3 billion or whoever can read. What an honor. Now, a little problem, the Chinese did shut that website down three months ago when we reported that Wen Jiaobao's mother was worth $2.7 billion, but they'll, they'll start it up again. We'll eventually get it going. Now, what do you think it means to me when my column is now in Chinese? I've been going to China for 20 years, and for 20 years I had one goal when I went to China, and that was to write something that my mother-in-law in Chicago would find interesting. That was my goal. 
Now it happens my mother-in-law in Chicago had never been to China. So it was fairly easy. I could actually write, hope I didn't, but I could, write an average column. And panda bears, chopsticks, eh, interesting place, China, okay? I, I, I could actually write an average column that would, my mother-in-law would have said, my, my son-in-law's in China, look at him. When my column is in Chinese twice a week, I have a different goal now. My goal is to tell people in Chengdu something they don't know about China. That is a wholly different task. Average is over for me. I gotta raise my game totally. To come to Switzerland or to China and to tell people there something that will get them to reflect and think differently about their country, that's a totally different task. So average is over for me like everybody else. I live in Bethesda, Maryland, about 45 minutes from Baltimore. Now, 50 years ago, the biggest employer in Baltimore was Bethlehem Steel Company. 50 years ago, you could actually drop out of high school, join the steel union, get an average job at Bethlehem Steel that paid an average wage that would actually be enough for you to buy an average house with an average yard so you could have 2.0 average kids and an average dog work an average number of hours and take an average number of trips to Disney World, go to an average number of baseball games, have a perfectly average career, have an average retirement and a wonderfully average funeral, okay? <laughs> All as a high school dropout. Who's the biggest employer in Baltimore today? Bethlehem Steel Company, so, sorry, who's the biggest employer in Baltimore today? Not Bethlehem Steel Company, Bethlehem Steel has disappeared. It's probably somewhere in India and China. The biggest employer in Baltimore today is Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. They don't let you cut the grass at Johns Hopkins without a BA, okay? <laughs> That's what's changed. Average is over. You've heard the story of the modern American factory. The modern American factory, textile factory, just has two employees now. Two employees, a man and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog, and the dog is there to keep the man away from the machines, okay? <laughs> now that's an exaggeration, but that's where things are going. You see, our middle class and yours was built on something called the high-wage, middle-skilled job. Our middle class for 50 years was built on the high-wage, middle skill job. There is increasingly no such thing. There will only be a high wage, high skill job. Average is over. That is the big change. Now what, what does this mean for education? I'm going to skip over some other stuff with the workforce and just talk about what does this mean for education? What it means in America, and I think in Switzerland, and in Europe, is that we now have three educational challenges. We need to bring our bottom to our average so much faster. We have so many young people in our country who have not completed high school, and if you do not complete high school today with the skills for some form of post-secondary education, there is nothing for you down there. There is nothing for you down there. Nothing that will sustain an average lifestyle. So we need to bring our bottom to our average so much faster. That's about more of the three R's. More reading, writing, and arithmetic. But we have another challenge. We need to bring our average to the global heights so much higher. Because that's where the action, that's where the jobs involve critical thinking and problem solving. That's where you want to be. That involves more of the three C's. Creativity, communication, and collaboration. That's the second challenge. Because as one of my favorite education writers, Tony Wagner says, it's not enough for you to graduate from high school college ready. You have to graduate from high school innovation ready. College ready is not enough. You've gotta be innovation ready. Because every boss now, needs everyone 
thinking like an innovator, looking for where new businesses and new opportunities can be forked off. You have to be relentlessly innovative and entrepreneurial. But we have a third challenge, and the third challenge has to do with motivation, has to do with instilling and inspiring motivation. Because one thing about the hyper-connected world, one thing about it is that it's blown away the walls and the ceilings. Wow. I mean, anyone with a cell phone now can get access to the cloud and start a company overnight, start a website overnight. It's great. The, the walls and the ceilings are gone, but so are the floors. And therefore, so much that's going to differentiate the successful from the unsuccessful is who takes advantage of what's out there, who has the motivation to take advantage of all that is now out there for individuals. Hence my saying, if it's not happening now, it's because you're not doing it. We have in America something called a 401k. It's a personal savings program that replaces defined contribution programs. And basically, what's happening in the world today is that for the 60 years after the Cold War, if the world had a meter, a dial, the dial was set over here to the left. It said, you live in a world of defined benefits. You work for 30 years, whether it's in the Swiss government, city hall, or for a Swiss company, you will get these benefits. Whether you're average, above average, you'll get these benefits. You live in a world of defined benefits. What's happened with the hyper-connecting of the world is the dial has shifted over here. It says you now live in a world of defined contributions. Your returns in the hyper-connected world are going to be much more closely correlated to your own specific contribution. Jamba Juice in New York City now knows who sells more Jamba Juice every 15 minutes. And when they decide who gets the overtime, they base it on those statistics. That's what's happening. Second thing that's happening is that we no longer live in a world of developed and developing countries. Get that out of your head, okay? That's very much round world. The world today is divided between what I call HIEs and LIEs, high imagination enabling countries and low imagination enabling countries. Because when the world is this hyper-connected, if I just have the spark of an idea now, if I just have the spark of an idea, I can go to Delta in Taiwan, they will design this for me. Skip over to Alibaba and Hangzhou, my friend Jack Ma, he will line up 30 cheap Chinese manufacturers for this. I can then jump over to Amazon.com, my pal Jeff Bezos will do my fulfillment and delivery and gift wrap it for your birthday. I can go to Freelancer.com and get someone to do my logo for $18.95 unless somebody else bids $17.95. And Craigslist will give me an accountant. They're all commodities except this. And therefore, countries that enable and nurture this and people who have the motivation to do this are going to be at a huge advantage. So let me close, because I want to leave time for questions, by preempting the first question. What do you tell your own kids? What do you tell your own kids? Well, I give my own kids five pieces of advice. Think like an immigrant, think like an artisan, think like a starter-upper in Silicon Valley. Always remember that PQ plus CQ is greater than IQ, and think like a waitress at my favorite pancake house. So let me explain. First, think like an artisan. How does the artisan think? This is very European. Who were the artisans? Artisans were those people before mass manufacturing, before the factory, who made every item individually. The artisan made every pair of shoes, every table, every piece of furniture, every plate, glass, chandelier, item of clothing, and saddle or boot 
the artisan made individually. This is an idea of Larry Katz at Harvard. And what, what did the most successful artisans do? They brought so much extra to what they did. They took so much pride in what they did, so much value add, that they carved their initials into their work at the end of the day. Do your job every day as if you've bought so much extra, so much unique value add that you want to carve your initials into it at the end of the day. Do that, kids, you'll be fine. Second, think like an immigrant. How does the new immigrant think? The new immigrant thinks, I just showed up here in Bern, Switzerland, and there's no legacy spot waiting for me at the University of Bern. I better figure out what's going on here and I better pursue those opportunities with more energy, vigor, and persistence than anybody else. An Armenian friend of mine likes to say, new immigrants are paranoid optimists. They're optimists because they came from somewhere worse and went somewhere they thought would be better, and they are paranoid because they think it can be taken away from them in any second. Friends, think like an immigrant because we are all actually new immigrants to the hyper-connected world. Third, think like a starter upper in Silicon Valley. Got this idea from Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. Reid likes to say in Silicon Valley, there's only one four-letter word. Actually, it starts with an F, but it isn't four letters. And that word is finished. Finished. If you ever think you're finished, you are really finished. Reed's motto is always be in beta. Always think of yourself as being in beta. Beta is that moment in the develop of a piece of software or technology when it's about 80, 90% done. They throw it over the wall, the community tests it, finds all the holes, they throw it back, you improve it, fix it, throw it over the wall again. Reed's philosophy is always be in beta. Always see yourself as a work in progress, engineering and re-engineering and relearning yourself. Alvin Toffler said this a long time ago. The new literacy today is not the ability to read and write. The new literacy today is the ability to learn and relearn quickly and often in a hyper-connected world. Fourth, PQ plus CQ is always greater than IQ. You give me a young person in this hyper-connected world who has a high passion quotient, a high persistence quotient, and a high curiosity quotient in a world of Google and Kickstarter and crowdsourcing where they can take their energy anywhere they want. I'll take them over a kid with a high IQ, intelligence quotient, any day of the week. And lastly, think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis, Minnesota, my hometown, my favorite restaurant. When I was writing this last book, I was eating at Perkins on a Sunday morning with my best friend, Ken Greer. I ordered three buttermilk pancakes and scrambled eggs. Ken ordered three buttermilk pancakes and fruit. The waitress took our orders, and after 15 minutes, she came back with our plates. She laid them down in front of us, and all she said to Ken was, I gave you extra fruit. That's all she said. We gave her a 50% tip. <laughs> Why did we give her a 50% tip? Because that waitress didn't control much, but she controlled the fruit ladle. And in her world, that was the source of her extra. She just ladled on a little extra fruit. What was that waitress doing in her own little world, her own little way? She was thinking entrepreneurially. Always think entrepreneurially whatever you do. So friends, if you take nothing away from this talk, please take this. Think like an immigrant, stay hungry. Think like an artisan, take pride. Think like a starter up in Silicon Valley and always stay in beta. Remember that PQ plus CQ is always greater than IQ. And think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House. And always, always be entrepreneurial. Because we all now do live in Garrison Keillor's mythical Lake Wobegon, where all the men are strong, all the women are beautiful, and all the children need to be above average.
Thank you very much.